chances to actually turn the situation upside down. Instead of looking at species loss, look at species recovery. And to better understand this, Anderson has made his way to Yellowstone National Park, where he's exploring the recovery of one of North America's most charismatic and controversial carnivores. Yellowstone National Park. crown jewel of America's park system. Its beauty is otherworldly. A fully intact ecosystem. Scientists say this is the natural world as it should be. But it hasn't always been this way. Sometimes it's hard to see the impact the loss of one species can have on an entire ecosystem. In order to demonstrate it, you sometimes have to look at the reverse. What happens when one species is reintroduced to an ecosystem? We've come here to Yellowstone Park because in 1995, gray wolves were brought back to this park. A total of 41 wolves were brought back here over two years. And since then, their numbers have increased steadily, and they've had a major impact on this entire area. To get a sense of that impact, we wanted to see the animal for ourselves. It's late afternoon in the park and the light is fading fast. It's not easy to find the wolves. They're elusive and very sensitive to the presence of humans. There's a lot of running, ducking, and hiding. There's a bison which died several uh, hundred yards from here along a little uh, river. At night, the wolves are going to come and feed on it. They were out here last night. It's a good chance they'll be back tonight. So we're trying to get as close as possible. We don't want to scare the wolves off by getting too close. There's a wolf right there. He's standing on a rock. Yeah. I see him. We're losing light in Yellowstone National Park, trying to get into position to see an animal that has captured people's imaginations and changed nearly the entire ecosystem of the park. There's a bison which died several uh, hundred yards from here along a little uh, river. At night, the wolves are going to come and feed on it. Do they always feed around this time? Yep. This is about the time they come out. Doug Smith is the wildlife biologist in charge of the wolf reintroduction project. We hunker down in the sagebrush for about 30 more minutes, then spot movement in the distance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK, great. You're officially a wolf watcher now. <laughs> and uh, is that your first wolf? Yeah, it is. OK, great. That we're actually seeing wolves here is something that just 15 years ago seemed impossible. Viewed as both pests and vicious predators, wolves were the target of a government-sponsored extermination campaign at the beginning of the 20th century. Along the way, they were completely eliminated from the park. But public perception and biological appreciation for the wolf began to change in the 1980s. Bison and elk populations exploded because there were no natural predator like the wolf to keep their numbers down. In 1995, after a pitched battle with a nearby ranching community who were afraid wolves would kill their livestock, Doug Smith transplanted the first wolves back into Yellowstone. The reintroduction is now considered one of the greatest conservation success stories in the past few decades. What do you think it is about wolves that surprise people, surprised everyone here, just how adaptive they are? Yeah, I think so. You know, they just fell right back into their old role, even though they had been missing for 70 years. And that role, the role of just one single species, has profoundly altered Yellowstone's entire ecosystem. It's what scientists call a trophic cascade, when one animal, usually a top predator, has a cascading top-down effect on different levels of the food chain. It's almost a paint-by-numbers illustration of how a healthy ecosystem should work. It starts with the wolf's favorite prey, elk. And I was circling four wolves from his observation plane earlier in the week, Doug saw wolves surround and kill a bull elk. He takes us into the shallow draw where he thinks we'll find the carcass. 
there he is. There's virtually nothing left. And so he probably died right here. So these bones all around here, there's leg bones here, there's leg bones up there. We're done by wolves, bears, coyotes, what we call the scavenger community. I have not seen that beetle. But it doesn't stop for the big animals. A single wolf kill means even the little ones eat too. Even things like these little beetles, these little bugs here. Yep. We've actually documented uh, a team of researchers in, that work with us, hundreds of different species of beetles that use wolf kills. We estimate just a ballpark figure. You know, 2,000 elk are hitting the ground a year in this part of Yellowstone due to about seven wolf packs. So you add all that up for the vertebrate scavengers, the invertebrate scavengers, these bugs, that becomes a real direct effect of wolf killing in, in terms of the big picture of ecosystems that wasn't taking place before wolves got here. That trophic cascade because of the wolf's presence here doesn't stop with what it kills. There's also a ripple effect through the plant life. This is a stand of willows? Yeah, it is. And this stand has uh, grown up in the last 10 years since wolves were reintroduced. So before, when there were no wolves here, what would this look like? Uh, this stand was much shorter. Um, I can't remember exactly, but it certainly wasn't over my head like this. So before there were wolves here, the elk had no one attacking them, no one hunting them, so they had a lot of time to just chew on willow bushes. That's true, and there were a lot more elk. Uh -huh. So the combination of behavioral changes in the elk, getting inside their head, worrying about wolves, and fewer elk, we think has conspired to produce a flush in growth on these willows. And that flush in willow growth is now providing a rare and critical habitat for songbirds. Cover for birds and food for beavers. Remember, all of this is because of just one animal. How has this affected the, the beaver population? Well, they've taken advantage of it too. Uh, willows are key food for them. They build dams and lodges with it. So they've uh, responded as well. I'm going to try to find some. Yeah, we can look. So that's a beaver lodge? Yeah. The beavers uh, put that lodge in here a few years ago, and they dammed the creek to create this pond. Before the wolves, there were around six beavers in this part of the park. There are now more than 90. What impact do beavers have? I mean, what other species do they impact? Well, beavers are great creators of watery habitat, so anything that uses water is going to benefit. This is really good habitat for fish, birds, amphibians, small mammals, moose, mink, otter. Uh, this was just a meadow, and now it's a pond, and that creates a lot of opportunity for life. We came here really because we've been traveling around the world looking at how the removal of one species can have an impact. This is sort of the reverse of how the insertion of a species can have a, a ripple effect. Absolutely. This is an important kind of lesson for the rest of the world because carnivores across the globe have been targets of human persecution. And so we're trying to study and understand these are carnivore effects on how they structure ecosystems. Back at the wolf kill, as the sun is setting, more of the Lamar Valley pack comes in to eat. Then there's a report of a fight in the distance between a bear and a wolf. And this is exactly what you had hoped for all along you know, with the reintroduction. That yeah. It would be this kind of active, natural cycle. Yep, absolutely. Wolves. Fighting with black bears is 